Okay, welcome back to Inclusive Design 24, 2023, brought to you in partnership with our Platinum supporters, Google and Intopia, and our Gold supporters, Barrier Break and Tetralogical. Reminder that Inclusive Design 24 is a respectful community and that you can find our code of conduct in the Inclusive Design 24 website. You can follow us on Mastodon, and if you have questions for the presenter, post them using the ID24 hashtag or post them in the YouTube chat for a Q&A at the end of the session. And now I'm going to once again turn things over to my guest host, Christian. Thank you, Hans. So um, our speaker, Jan Jaap de Groot, also known as uh, JJ for short, uh, comes from the Netherlands and has been uh, developing accessible apps uh, for 10 years. And he was recently lead accessibility developer for the Dutch COVID-19 apps, uh, which resulted in the first fully accessible government apps in the Netherlands. So this is also the topic of uh, JJ's talk. Welcome, JJ. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So let's get started. Um, so we already had this introduction, but just a little recap. So my role is accessibility engineer at Abra, where we do uh, training, consultancy, audits, and all related to mobile accessibility. And also one of the co-founders of the APT Foundation, where I'm currently the chairman of. It's a nonprofit foundation aimed at sharing knowledge about mobile accessibility. And a little bit about my background. So I studied first uh, software engineering, and then I wanted to do a little bit more with actual users. So then I studied uh, human computer interaction, where I mostly focused on accessibility and on people with disabilities and how I can use technology to support them. So in my daily job, yeah, I'm basically working with apps uh, every day. So this is also the topic of the talk. And I will also do a comparison uh, between uh, accessibility of apps compared to the accessibility of websites and how the testing is really much different. So overview of the topics of today. First, a little introduction to mobile accessibility. Secondly, uh, we'll be talking about manual accessibility testing of apps. Third, will be about automated accessibility testing of apps. And then the fourth chapter is at the conclusion. So let's get started with mobile accessibility. So why is mobile accessibility important? Well, first of all, as you probably know, if you're part of this ID24 conference, um, over 1 billion people in the world have a disability, but maybe you didn't know yet, 50% uh, of all people are using accessibility features on their mobile device, according to the research we've done in the APT Foundation. So the numbers are listed below. So on iOS, it turned out that 45% of people had one or more accessibility settings activated. And on Android, it was even more. It was 59 people that had at least one accessibility setting activated. And we messaged this using like a native mobile library, embedded in a couple apps. And those apps had over, I believe, 4 million users. Um, it was done in the Netherlands, so it might not be representative for your country or for the world. But it does show that much more people are actually using accessibility features than people expect. And also, well, accessibility of apps is especially important because very few apps are accessible. Um, we've also done some research for the government apps because those are now uh, mandatory to be uh, accessible. And now it has been two years since this legislation and five years since the announcement. And well, a couple months ago, only two and a half percent of the government apps were fully accessible, but they were getting more accessible. And also I will show later uh, why it's so difficult to get an app to be fully accessible according to the legislation. Well, little introduction, I guess for most people it's known, but maybe for those who don't know yet, um, there's different kinds of disabilities. And then on mobile devices, there's many assistive technologies available for them. So we have cognitive impairments, we have features like uh, maybe uh, text to speech and using like a dictionary. Hearing impairments, we have features like subtitles, mobility impairments, we have features like assistive touch, speech impairments, you know, we can type and have some other features embedded in apps, visual impairments, we have text enlargement and also like screen readers for impairments caused by aging. We now also have, since the new iOS version and also on Android, like 
you can make apps or make your phone, uh, you know, hide some more distracting features and make it easier for people to use. And then also important to consider that there are some people that have like permanent disabilities, but also some people might have temporary disabilities or situational disabilities. So it's important to recognize that everyone at some point in their life will be disabled, whether it's, you know, situational, temporary or permanently. So a little bit more about accessibility features that are, are available on apps or actually on mobile phones. And I think it's important to note the difference between desktop or laptop and like websites, because with uh, like a Mac OS or Windows, you usually have to install assistive technologies yourself. But if you compare this to mobile phones, they actually ship with accessibility features built into them. And this also makes it easier for developers to support those features because there's less difference between the kind of assistive technologies that people have, you know, installed because it's all pre-installed. So we have on Android iOS, a screen reader. It's called VoiceOver on iOS and then TalkBack on Android. We have switch control available also on Android, also iOS. Keyboard access, meaning you can use your keyboard to navigate. So not only to type, but actually use like the arrow keys and space bar, enter bar, enter keys to navigate an app. Then we have voice control to control an app by your voice. It's also supported both Android and iOS. And then larger text, also available Android, iOS. And then dark mode, some people consider it accessibility, some people don't, but I do personally consider this an accessibility feature, which is also available on the latest Android versions and also on the latest iOS versions. So yeah. And also because we did this measurement, turns out that around 50% yeah, of people are using some kind of accessibility feature. So there's many more accessibility features which I have not listed here, but yeah, it's important to know that many people use those features. So it's important for our developers to well, consider this and support those features in their apps. A little bit about the legislation for apps. Um, this is based in the Netherlands and in Europe, so it might be different for your country. Um, so we have the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which basically means People with disabilities need to have equal access to everything, including apps. Then we have in Europe, the Web Accessibility Directive. This is for government websites and also for government apps that they need to be accessible. And then we have the European Accessibility Act, which is not live yet. It's around two years from now. And this is mostly for commercial apps like transportation apps, e-commerce apps, and also websites that they need to be accessible by them. Then a little bit about guidelines that apply to mobile. Um, and this is where it gets a little bit interesting and also explains why maybe less apps than you might expect are accessible. So we have the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, so websites. Then we have WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, once again, web. And for apps, they need to conform to WCAG 2.1 uh, level AA, double A. So basically we have these guidelines, which are well, supposed to be like technology agnostic, but still mostly focused on websites. And we are trying to apply them to apps. But one of the biggest problems is that it can be difficult already to understand how to apply them to websites. And then when you try to apply them to apps, it gets even more confusing. So that's why the W3C also has this mobile accessibility task force, which is trying to help you know, the understanding documents, like how to apply the guidelines to apps. But still, there's one major problem, which is why also we founded the App Foundation. So we have apps, and we are focusing specifically on app accessibility. And mostly what we are focusing on is like code samples. Because even though there are now ways to understand how to use the guidelines for apps, if you find some app issue, how do you solve it? Because if you look at the, you know, WCAG, uh, like code samples, it's all based on HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and then even, you know, like some silver light. Um, but there's no code samples for native iOS, for native Android, or maybe React Native or Flutter. And this is something we are trying to solve with apt. So some of the code samples I will be referencing today are also from apt. So if you're interested in getting to know more about mobile accessibility, I can definitely recommend to go to apt.org. It's all free and all open source. And we have over 300 code samples and over 150 articles about mobile accessibility. So let's get into the actual um, testing part, starting with manual testing. And I will cover 
10 different types of accessibility issues. So due to the time, I will go through them pretty quickly, but it will give you an idea of you know, how to test for certain accessibility issues on mobile uh, apps. So starting out with orientation, um, this is something that, you know, it still confuses me. Why are apps not responsive? If you're looking now at websites, almost all websites are responsive. So if I'm using a mobile phone, if I'm using a tablet, if I'm using a desktop, if I'm using a super large screen, you know, websites tend to work pretty well nowadays. But for some reason on apps, most apps are limited to portrait orientation. So landscape orientation is not working. And if you look back at the guidelines, we have guideline 1.3.4 orientation, which is stating that, you know, apps or websites should work in multiple orientations. So if your app is locked to only portrait mode, it does not pass this criteria. So you have to implement landscape mode for all screens in your app. And the interesting thing is here that if you are an app developer and you're building an app, by default, landscape mode is supported. So developers are choosing deliberately to not support landscape mode. And this basically makes their lives a lot harder because now with this accessibility legislation, they have to support landscape mode. And as you know, if you have to implement something afterwards, it takes much more time, resources and money to fix this. So example I'm using is DVD. It's like digital ID. It's an app in the Netherlands, a government app which is now actually fully accessible. Um, so it's a government app to identify yourself for many government services. So basically, you know, everything related to government, you probably need to use this app, which is why it's super important that it's accessible. Um, and you can see that when I rotate my device to landscape mode, it not only works, but it also updates its layout, like responsive design. But then if I look at the Spotify app, which is actually very accessible, but it doesn't support landscape mode. So imagine I'm watching maybe YouTube in, in landscape mode and I switch over. Well, this app doesn't work. So I have to rotate my device again, but maybe I have like a motor impairment. Maybe I cannot physically rotate my device because it's maybe in some kind of car kit or maybe it's on a power wheelchair. And this is why it's super important that apps all support you know, portrait and also landscape mode. So users are not forced to rotate their device if they want to use your app. Um, how to support this? So this is like a table showing the platform, some APIs and some pros and cons. Um, I don't have time to go through all of them, but um, I've listed Android, iOS, Flutter, React Native, Severin, and also in comparison to websites. So, um, I will also share the slides afterwards. Um, but basically, on Android, iOS, Twitter, React Native, Xamarin, you have the option to, you know, lock your app to certain uh, orientation. And by default, on Android, all orientations are supported. So it's really developers that really chose to disable this. Then, for some reason, on iOS, by default, the upside down uh, orientation is not enabled. So you have to enable this yourself. And then Flutter, React Native, and Xamarin, these are like cross-platform uh, frameworks. They are using the native Android and native iOS underneath, basically. Um, so they are basically using the same ways that Android and iOS are using. And on websites, well, mostly if you want to support, you know, responsive design, you're using like a media query, which has many options, you know, like pixels or EMs or RAM. So uh, websites, it's you know, a little bit ahead of apps in most ways. Well, secondly, we have text scaling. So normally your app has like this default font size, which is 100%. And then on Android, also iOS, you can go to the accessibility settings of your phone. And then on iOS, you need to enable larger accessibility sizes. And then you can change your font size all the way to 310%. One problem is if you're using this setting, it just shows like a small A and a large A. So you don't really know which percentage it is. So if you add this widget to your iOS device called uh, something like font size, it actually does show the exact percentage. Um, so it goes all the way up to 310%. And for WCAG testing, um, the problem is there's only an option for 190%. And then the next step is 235%. So usually I'm testing with 235% text size. 
and not with 200% because I cannot set my device to this exact value. So how should it work? When I increase my text size, the text size in the app should also increase and none of the content should be truncated. So I have an example of Zoom. So Zoom does, have, does actually support large font size, but then um, it only supports it to two lines. So it tells me don't connect to dot, dot, dot. And I'm really not sure what I'm not connecting to. So this is a problem because there's no way for me to get like the full information if I were using this large font size. And then also maybe to note, sometimes there's no space for large font size, which is common in apps. And then you can actually long press. So if I long press this cancel button in the top left corner of the Zoom app, it will actually show a large version. And the same is for this toggle between meeting and events. Usually I can long press those elements to show like a, a large text version. So that's different compared to websites where you usually don't have those kind of gestures built in. So looking again at the um, APIs on Android, we have something called scale independent pixels, SP, which automatically scale. It's similar to like the EM or RAM unit on websites. On iOS, we have something called UI font metrics. You have to write your own implementation to scale custom fonts. If you're using the default Apple fonts, they actually scale automatically. But most apps are using custom fonts. Then on Flutter and React Native, it's both called font size and it actually scales automatically also on iOS. So it's actually making it easier for you to also support dynamic font size on iOS. Then on Xamarin, we have this method called set enable accessibility scaling for named font sizes, a pretty long method name. And it's basically using the same method uh, as the UI font metrics on iOS. So you have to write your own implementation and Android is working automatically. Well, comparing this to websites, usually to scale fonts, you were using the RAM unit or EM unit. And usually actually you're not enlarging the font size. Mostly I feel like people are using the browser zoom feature to zoom into like 200% or even larger. And well, this works like out of the box. Um, the browsers take care of this for you. Then moving on to the third issue, which is contrast. Um, and this is another interesting issue of apps, which is showing, which I also mentioned in my talk description, with apps, you don't have access to the source code. So it's difficult to check what colors are being used or which font size is being used or actually which font is being used because you cannot inspect this if you don't have the source code. So with websites, I can open up my developer tools and inspect many of those uh, options. But with apps, it's... It feels uh, weird, but you actually have to make a screenshot. So I make a screenshot of my app. And then you can open this screenshot in like a specific color app. So there are some color contrast apps for Android and for iOS, but I usually use AirDrop or email or Google Drive or something or iCloud to share it to my computer. And then I have this app, I'm using macOS, it's called Color Slurp. And then I can pick a color. And then I copy this color and I go to like web aim, the color contrast checker, and then fill in my foreground color, background color, and check if it passes. Which, you know, compared to websites, it's just so much slower. Because on websites, you can do like one press of the button and it, you know, checks all the contrast values for you. And another issue is when I'm checking text, I have an image in the middle, which is showing an enlarged M. It's, it has multiple shades of blue. So it's quite difficult for me as an auditor to select the actual blue value that's being used. Because if I select like the darkest color, I'm getting this 4.77 to one contrast ratio. If I'm selecting one of the lighter colors, I'm getting like a 2.96 contrast ratio. So which color is being used in the code? You know, with normally with CSS, like you can inspect this, get the exact color code and make a check. But with apps, this can be difficult, especially with text. For example, this button, there's also an orange button. This is really easy to pick the color because it's a solid orange color. So I can be quite certain to pick the right color. But even then, due to compression of screenshots and also due to sharing them maybe as JPEG instead of PNG, it's not like a lossless file. Some colors get changed or maybe my Mac has different color options. So with apps, yeah, sometimes it can be difficult to really judge if a color has enough contrast or not. So usually I have to ask the developers of the app or the designers, like what colors are being used in your app. And even then, sometimes the designers tell some colors are being used and then somehow the developers are using a different color. 
So I still have to check and make sure it's okay, but this really shows that something simple like color contrast checking is difficult. And then another problem on Android is if you're checking an Android app, some Android apps have like screenshots disabled. So it's an Android feature. You can disable screenshots. Mostly banking apps have this disabled and other like financial apps. And then it's not possible to take a screenshot and it's not possible to you know, work around this. So using those apps, you cannot make a screenshot and not check the color contrast. Um, so just showing some issues with apps, you know, your life as an auditor is definitely more uh, difficult compared to websites. But for apps, you can make like a separate version, just like websites, you, you can maybe audit on a subdomain. So with apps, you can also make a, a you know, special version, like a developer version or beta version, which does not have this flag to disable screenshots. And then I can use this version to actually extract the color codes. Or sometimes you can ask for the source code. Usually companies don't give this, but you can try. Uh, it will be easier to check uh, the actual source code. Then contrast uh, the APIs. It's quite funny to me or interesting. All the APIs are named color. So all using like the US names. Um, yeah, and then maybe I want to highlight iOS. So iOS, when you have this color asset, it has like a light mode, dark mode, but also a high contrast mode color available. So if you want to support high contrast, which is a setting on iOS, well, Apple has made it really easy for you. It's a little bit harder on Android to also support like a high contrast uh, color. And with websites, well, you can also, you know, put in any hexadecimal color, and then you can use media queries to, um, well, use like dark mode colors. So it's all possible. Then moving on to the fourth issue, which is the accessibility name label. So if I'm using voice control, it will show information. Um, especially on iOS, I can tell voice control, like show labels, and it will show me all the interactive labels on the screen. And then I can quickly see some issues. There's some label, it's called privacy statement, and then link to external website. So inside the accessibility name, it's using like a hint link to external website. So this is not allowed. Um, then I can see actually another issue. There's a back button and it's labeled Vorige, which is Dutch for back. So this should be labeled as back. So the localization has an issue. So this is really a tip I would like to give if you're checking accessibility names, labels, or interactive elements. You can use voice control to really see the labels. You could also use the screen reader, um, but I like using voice control. Make it quicker for me to check this. A little bit about the name and labels. Um, so all the platforms have different properties to set a name or label. So on Android, you use content description. iOS, it's called accessibility label. Flutter, it's called semantics label. React Native, it's called accessibility label. Then Xamarin, it's automation properties dot name. And then this compares a little bit to like ARIA label on websites. Then accessibility role. So um, roles are really important for people to understand what kind of elements are available on the screen. So I have this heading, it's called older heading. So I know it's a heading. I have this button, it's called verification button. So I know it's a button. Then I have to my DVD button link. It tells me it's a button, but also a link. So it tells me it opens like an external website. And why are these also important? So with this rotor on uh, TalkBack and also on VoiceOver, if you are like a screen reader user, you can skip to headings really quickly. And if headings are not marked as heading, you cannot do this. And also interesting to note, because you don't have the source code, you are really forced to use the screen reader to check the accessibility role. Um, and even then, sometimes developers can trick you because sometimes they make this name like i just showed before they put like the link or button inside the name and because the screen reader is just outputting text or you're hearing text or audio you don't really know if it's actually set as role or if they just put the role like inside the name um so yeah this is an issue in apps sometimes you can get tricked by uh, the screen reader because it doesn't tell you how this sentence is constructed but one way that can help you there's like this caption panel for screen readers both android have this and ios have this and it will show like subtitles for everything the screen reader is saying. 
And then you can check for like the comma, because if there's a comma between words, usually this is put in there by the screen reader. So this is show like the different parts that are used to construct this sort of, uh, you know, sentence. All right, little example again. So we have set role description, set class name for Android, accessibility traits for iOS, semantics rule for Flutter, accessibility rule for React Native, and then Xamarin, we have to use this third party library called semantic effect set of description. And this compares a little bit to websites like role or the ARIA role description. Number six, accessibility value. Um, so it's important to know, for example, with checkboxes that it tells you it's on or off or selected or not selected. So there's English selected. It tells me selected button because there's no checkbox role on iOS. And then it also tells me for the other non-selected option, it tells me not selected. And then for the switch, it tells me switch button, which is actually supported. And then it tells me off when it's off and on when it's on. So this is also something you have to check using the screen reader. Um, yeah, and many times when people are building like custom, you know, checkboxes, custom toggles, they do not include these accessibility values. So important to check all those. Otherwise, someone that's using a screen reader will not know whether you know, a toggle is on or off. So on Android, it's called accessibility note info compat. iOS, we have accessibility value. Flutter, we have semantics value. React Native, we have accessibility value. And on Xamarin, it's actually not supported. And this is similar to like websites with ARIA value null and ARIA value text. So seven, accessibility state, which is actually not really supported that well on apps. So I have an example here for website and that's like accordion and it tells me collapsed and expanded based on the state. But in apps, the collapsed and expanded states are not available. So many times developers, they when using an accordion because many apps do have accordion they have to build their own accessibility you know uh, support so they usually don't get this right so usually they put in the state in like the name or they put it in the role but it should be put like in accessibility value or maybe on android there is support for accessibility state because on android there's a new api from android 11 and higher it's called set state description uh, but then on ios you can only use the accessibility traits to set like the enabled or the selected trait, but not like expand collapsed. And on Flutter, the same. There's no custom states. React Native also not. Xamarin is not even supported. And then on websites, we have so many ARIA states like ARIA selected, but many others. So this shows again that websites are really more extensive accessibility support related to, uh, well, also the accessibility state. So number eight, we have accessibility order. Once again, I, I, I recommend you to use the voice control here. Um, it's showing not names this time. I tell show numbers. So it's showing actually the numbers in order. So I can quickly verify if the numbers are following, following a logical order. So on my screenshots, it's going from one to nine, one to six, and one to six in a logical order. So no problems here. And you can also use the screen reader to also you know, swipe left, swipe right, all the way and check how the focus moves through, the, through your app. So this is similar to how it works when auditing a website. Um, so on Android, we have two APIs, set accessibility, traversal before and after to adjust the normal uh, focus order. On iOS, we have a property called accessibility elements to also set the order that assistive technology should follow. On Flutter, we have semantic sort key to also make a sort order of how uh, someone should go through your app. React Native is actually not supported. You cannot adjust the accessibility order, which is a problem. And on Xamarin, we have something called tap index that is tap stop. And this compares to like tap index on websites. So it's interesting to know that yeah, React Native is really a big framework for using a you know, building apps and it doesn't support changing the accessibility order, which is really, uh, you know, a problem. Maybe it's supported by now, but last time I checked, it was not supported. Number nine, accessibility focus change. So we have um, an app which is showing a PIN code. And whenever I enter my PIN code, I enter my five digits. 
automatically I can force my focus to move to like the next screen or move to a different element. And the same when I'm scanning like a QR code, whenever I scan a QR code, it will automatically maybe go to the next screen or maybe move the focus. So this is something you can also do on websites and showing like a model or, you know, automatically moving the focus to input fields. Um, so how to verify this? Once again, you can use the screen reader and you can see what happens whenever you input uh, data. And then on Android, you can send an event called type view focused. On iOS, you can send a notification, screen change or layout change. Then on Flutter, also a really large framework, but it doesn't support to manually change the accessibility focus, but you can build your own uh, you know, extension, but it's not like a first party support. React Native, it does have set accessibility focus. And then on Xamarin, you also have to use a third party library to move focus. And this is similar to, I would say, like the tab index on websites and the focus like JavaScript method to force focus on a certain element. And then number 10, we have the accessibility status messages. So those are announced by screen readers. So you have to enable a screen reader to check if any status messages are being shown. So for example, in this app, I'm entering my pin code and it shows a loading icon. Then this loading icon is shown visually. So it should also be indicated to people who are using a screen reader. So whenever I enable my screen reader, it actually tells me one moment, please, which is telling me that it's in a loading state. And the same is for when I'm entering my pin code. So I'm entering my pin code and I get an error message. So this error message should be announced because it's shown visually, the screen has changed. And it tells me the pin code is incorrect. You have two attempts left. So even though the focus is like on this zero button, so this is also similar to how you would test uh, a website. Um, and then there's support for all platforms. So Android has type announcement. iOS has also an announcement. Flutter, React Native, and Xamarin all use like semantic surface announce. Uh, so you can announce status messages for all major platforms. And this is similar to like websites with ARIA Live. Um, so ARIA Live, I don't know, when I use it, it's a little bit tricky. Sometimes it doesn't work like you want it to work. So in this sense, apps actually have an advantage because you have full support about what the screen reader is announcing. You can also stop the announcements whenever you would like. You can queue announcements. So because it's native app, you have a little bit more control over the uh, operating system. All right, so this concludes the manual testing part. Now I will mention a little bit about automated accessibility testing, because most I have shown now is really about manually testing using the font size enlargement, using the screen reader, using voice control, and maybe other assistive technologies like the keyboard to make sure an app is working as it should, according to the web content accessibility guidelines. So is it possible to automatically test an app or like what kind of tools exist? Going to start with a couple of free tools. So on Android, we have two official uh, automated testing tools. The first one is the Accessibility Scanner app. This is an app built by Google. It's available from the Google Play Store, and it basically shows like a button, floating button. And then whenever you open an app, you can press this button, and it will scan this app for accessibility issues and tell you how to solve them. Then we also have the Accessibility Test Framework for Android which is also built by Google. Basically, this framework is embedded inside this accessibility scanner app. So you can use this like an SDK in your app to automatically check for certain issues. Um, it's important to know that it's based on Android guidelines. It's not based on like the web content accessibility guidelines. It's based on like Android's own guidelines, but they do overlap. Um, and then thirdly, we have accessibility insights for Android which was built by Microsoft, but actually when I checked it out yesterday, it turns out it's now deprecated. So it will no longer receive any updates. So this is or was a tool um, desktop app where you could also inspect like uh, your Android app for accessibility issues. Then on iOS, we have tools built by Apple. We have the Xcode Accessibility Inspector, which has been there for a couple of years to inspect any iOS app. So you can install Xcode, open this tool and you can inspect for any accessibility issues and also perform like an audit. So it also checks, you know, based on Apple's guidelines, not on the WCAG. And then what's new since iOS 17, so basically since uh, this Monday, we have the XE UI Accessibility Audit API. 
So using this, you can check for, I believe, like 10 different kinds of accessibility uh, issues in your app automatically. So it's like an SDK, like an API. So this is really nice. Um, so it's interesting that both Apple and Google have like this inspector apps, and then they have also the logic behind this embedded in like an API or framework. Um, and then thirdly, we have accessibility snapshot, which is a third party library built by Cash App. And they uh, basically use this snapshot testing, which is a way of testing, like regression testing in iOS. And they basically compare, uh, you know, different screenshots of the accessibility tree and check if there are any, you know, changes. Then if you go to app.org, there's an article about automated accessibility testing tools. So there's more free tools available. Um, so all these are actually links. So if you would like to receive the slides, um, you can also open all those links. Moving on to paid tools. So we have the X DevTools Mobile, uh, which is built by DQ. So X, you probably know it from uh, X for websites. So they also have tooling for mobile. Um, they have something new called X DevTools Mobile Analyzer, which is uh, like a solution which doesn't need the source code of the app. So you can use it to inspect any app. I haven't used it myself, but it's supposed to check any app for accessibility issues. You also have X DevTools Mobile SDKs, which are like SDKs, which are actually using the web content accessibility guidelines to check for issues automatically. I also haven't used this, but well, I have used X Web, so it's probably uh, also good. Then we have Evinced. So Evinced is like a new uh, player in sort of the mobile accessibility space. They also have like a mobile flow analyzer to check your app for any issues for both Android and iOS, as far as I know. And they also have SDKs, which can also detect issues automatically. Um, Events and, and, and X are mostly focused on like larger corporate companies. And then we have a reveal, which is um, focused on only iOS, not on Android. And they have something new called Reveal Accessibility Workspace, which also allows you to inspect apps like iOS apps and then check kind of what values are being used. So for reveal, you need access to the source code for events SDK and the X SDK. You also need access to the source code. So as an auditor, you are not able to use these, but you can use like the mobile analyzers um, without source code. And then also on app, there's an article with more paid tools actually. Right now, I don't think there's any more paid tools, but maybe in the future uh, there will be. Or if you are actually a, a developer which has a free tool or paid tool for mobile accessibility, please let me know. So we can update the article on apt. Lastly, little sneak review of something we are working on. Uh, so we are working on Abra AI, which is going to be a tool to automatically check accessibility of any app. Basically, you just provide us with the app and we check it automatically. Then we are working on Abra Desktop, which I'm showing a screenshot of, which is a tool to sort of explore the accessibility of your app in 3D and also showing all the properties on the right hand side. So it works like connect your Android device, connect your iOS device, then select it from the drop down. It will extract all the apps installed on your device and it will show this also in the drop down. And then you select one of those apps, you press the play button and it will start debugging the accessibility uh, information in like a 3D interactive uh, way. And you can select elements and then check all the properties. So like I mentioned, with screen readers, it can be quite difficult to know like what properties is it using to speak. And with this desktop debugger, I can see exactly what kind of accessibility data is available for a certain screen or a certain element. So it's really useful for me. I'm already using this in my uh, like audit uh, audits. So yeah, quite useful tool. And we're also working on an SDK. So if you're interested in any of these tools, uh, visit abra.ai. You can sign up for our sort of newsletter and get uh, beta access when we go live. So this um, concludes my talk. So what is actually my conclusion? Um, so native mobile accessibility versus web accessibility. Um, I think I've talked lots of information, maybe a little bit too much if you're not you know, familiar with apps, but to conclude, like, so websites, it definitely have a head start compared to apps. I mean, websites have existed for many more years compared to apps. Apps are basically like little over 10 years old. So it's still relatively young. 
Um, apps are evolving, apps are catching up, but websites have so many more tooling and so many more documentation, so many more code samples, so many more guidelines. So apps, you know, it's not on the same level yet. And then another problem is that the accessibility guidelines have not been written specifically for apps. So now in the Dutch legislation, in the European legislation, but also in like the US legislation with section 508, um, it's all referring to the web content accessibility guidelines for apps, even though it can be really difficult to apply them to apps. And even though there are like no code samples to actually fix issues whenever you find one. So this is a big issue. Then apps have less tools for automated and also for manual accessibility testing, like contrast checkers and all those sort of web extensions that exist. Those are really not available for apps. So it's much more about manual testing much less about like automatically testing like contrast issues and other issues. Then app source code, it cannot be inspected unlike websites. So whenever I want to check like a color code, I cannot do this. Whenever I want to check, is it using ARIA label? Is it using something else? I cannot do this. I have to use the screen reader or use like, you know, one of those tools like I mentioned that actually, you know, extract accessibility data from your phone. And then lastly, well, mobile devices have accessibility features built in versus user installed. So it's important to note, you know, you can really use the built in accessibility features, which is making it easier to start because you don't need to pay for like an expensive screen reader and expensive voice control software. You can just use the built in features to audit an app. Just get a phone, you're basically ready to go. All right, that concludes my talk. If there are any questions, feel free to ask them now. You can also send me an email if you want to get the slides or maybe they will be published. Also, uh, my email is janja at abra.nl. I'm also on Twitter or x um, at janja de Groot and also on LinkedIn, well, also my full name. And I have like this QR code available if you want to scan uh, you know, your screen, you can connect with me on, uh, on LinkedIn. So thanks, looking forward to any uh, questions. All right, thank you very much, Anja. That was great. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, Christian, you want to take the first one? Yes. Uh, so uh, question number one is, are there attempts at making App Foundation's guides the official endorsed accessible web app cookbook flanking the upcoming European Accessibility Act? Maybe do you have plans in that direction? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we would love to, but... One issue with the App Foundation now is sort of the, the, the funding parts, because it's quite expensive to actually, you know, spend all those hours and time to get like, you know, to a point where you have like sort of official guidelines. If you look at the W3C, you know, it's been there for many years and many, you know, funding. Uh, and with Apt, we currently have no active funding. So we're looking actually for new sponsors. So if you are, you know, interested in sponsoring us, would be great. Um, so yeah, we do actually hope that maybe at one point apt can be, you know, the official guideline, but this is a process that will take, you know, multiple years. And also we need like a multi-year funding to do something like this, but yeah, apt is like nonprofit also open source. So we really, yeah, looking forward to having people contribute also to our, you know, knowledge base and, uh, you know, work together. Thank you. Um, you had a, um, there's a question about something that you said about that link that uh, points to an external website. And you said that that hints in the in the accessible name wasn't allowed. Uh, the question was, uh, why wasn't it allowed? Because it would pass the, the label and name uh, success criterion. But I think what you meant was, is that the wrong property was used in that case, right? And if so, uh, what property would you recommend instead? Yeah, so maybe, I didn't say right, so maybe I was more mentioning about best practice. So best practice would be not to put this in an app. You would not put it in the name, but you would use a property called accessibility uh, hint. So then it's like a hint and users can enable this or disable this in the operating system settings. So they can sort of choose to have your app tell them a link will go to external link. So usually in an app, a link will always go to external app. So then it's sort of double information if you tell them it goes to external link. So users, if you use like accessibility hint, people can adjust their settings to make their screen reader tell them this information or not. 
But it's like yeah, a it becomes message. more of a yeah, accessible not description really rather than an accessible name. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, then one more question. Um, after working with all of them, which app development platform would you say offers the accessibility API that is the, the nicest to work with? Yeah. Um, well, I'm a little bit biased, but I uh, prefer native. So I'm mostly working myself at native Android, native iOS. And especially now, which I haven't mentioned the code samples, because with apt, the code samples are all from apt. So we don't have code samples yet for SwiftUI and Jetpack Compose because we, we are looking for people to contribute or to fund us, but um, I would say SwiftUI and Jetpack Compose are really accessible, like declarative way of building apps. And especially SwiftUI just takes care of so many accessibility things for you. Um, and then the problem with Flutter and React Native and also like Xamarin or like Maui.net or other frameworks is, yeah, they are not native. So sometimes they, are missing certain accessibility features that native does have. And sometimes you cannot access them because they have certain abstraction layers. You cannot sometimes adjust certain behavior. So if you want to make sure your app is successful, I would definitely try to go for native, even though it's more work, you know, you have two code bases, you will definitely get the most accessible app using native uh, code. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, one last question. Uh, do you ever run into significant differences into how um, Android Talkback and iOS VoiceOver announce something? And if so, how would you uh, resolve that discrepancy? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Sometimes it's different um, with the order, especially. So sometimes with Talkback, it will first announce the state, and on iOS, it will announce the state maybe as the last option. So you have to get used to how the screen readers are working to determine like is it first announcing the name then the role then the value and then the state or is it using a different order because like i mentioned it's not really clear you know which which part of the text is coming from which accessibility property um so this is also why i'm now building this abra desktop app which can actually extract this information for you um but usually it's just a lot of trial and error and sort of you know trying to figure it out. And a lot of times I actually ask the developers of the app to tell me like, how is this coded? Can you tell me what like, they were thinking? Yeah, how, how, like which properties are you actually using? Because sometimes it's not really clear from just the screen reader output. I also often find a discrepancy in like how atomic something is, like whether something is treated as a big, you know, yeah, object or I mean, if you can actually go to individual parts of it. Yeah. Like one problem I have, especially iOS, like when I'm using this subtitle caption panel and it's reading a phone number, sometimes it will show spaces in the caption panel, even though in the actual code, it's not using spaces. So sometimes the screen reader is sort of modifying the properties and you don't know if it's actually done on purpose by developers to announce phone numbers, like one by one, the numbers, instead of having like a large number announced. Uh, or is it actually Apple that's doing like this iOS screen reader logic that transforms like phone numbers or links? So yeah, this definitely uh, you have to get used to like you have to get used to how the screen readers work internally to sort of understand you know the output. Yeah, especially with financial data that sometimes they'll truncate numerical values that are actually yeah. important or they think something is an abbreviation and they'll just say some random word that has nothing to do with you know the actual string of text there yeah so I've also seen it, like, a lot of fun. Data, so sometimes i have this like this pound symbol or this euro symbol and sometimes it shows the symbol in the caption panel but sometimes it slow shows like euro as text so then i'm not sure like did the developers change like the euro sign to like euro text for screen readers or is apple doing some transformation or talkback so this is yeah sometimes you really have to ask the developers like how is it done in the code right all right, well, that was the last question. So thank you very much again. Um, we're going to wrap up this session and make space for the next one. Uh, if you like this session, hit the YouTube like button. Don't forget that you can subscribe to youtube.com slash inclusive design 24 uh, to be kept in the loop of our future events. Inclusive design 24 is brought to you with thanks to our supporters, Google, Intopia, Barrier Break, Technological, Intuit, 
in Poexia and the Law Offices of Lady Feingold. We'll be back at the hour for our next session. See you then, and thank you again, Jan Yao. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks to the hosts also.